morning. We've got some wonderful panelists joining, and I will turn it over now to the wonderful moderator, um, Manaka. Is that right? Did I say that right? Close, Manaka. Manaka. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, Gopinath, who is the president for Ipsos Social Media Exchange. So take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having us this morning. Um, we're excited to join you and be part of the Equality Lounge Lions Live. Um, Ipsos is actually a partner of the Female Quotient. And so we're looking forward to talking to you about a lot of the research we've been doing and the topic of the pandemic as well as uh, racial justice. And um, what we're really going to do today is we're gonna start with having Chris on our team uh, share some research with us. Um, and then we'll have a conversation. So just quickly to introduce everyone on the line. Uh, my name is Manika Gopinath, as Anna mentioned. I lead our social intelligence and communities practice in um, the US. What that means is we are gaining insights through the conversations happening in the online environment. Through social intelligence, we're looking at all of the public conversations happening, which as everyone knows is a very rich place to learn about how people are feeling, um, as well as engaging people through online communities to have more um, curated conversations about the experiences people are having, um, especially right now. Um, joining me, I have uh, Chris Jackson, who is a VP on our public affairs team. So Ipsos does a lot of work with media partners, publishing really important research about um, a lot of the topics we'll talk about today. Um, and I'll let him introduce himself in a bit more depth in a second. Uh, we also have uh, Lindsay Frank, who is um, leads our creative excellence team in the US. Um, she works in our advertising research practice. And then we have April Jeffries, who leads our ethnography practice in um, the qualitative group at Ipsos globally. So I'll let each of them introduce themselves in more detail um, as we jump in. But do you want to start, Chris? Sure, thank you, Minika. Um, it's great to be here with everyone, a real privilege. Um, I'm going to start off by really just sort of setting the table for the rest of the panel to sort of discuss a lot of these issues. I lead our public polling practice. I'm a pollster uh, by training, by trade. Uh, we run public opinion research with a lot of news partners, including ABC News, The Washington Post, uh, Thomson Reuters, USA Today, uh, including a number of others. And, and we've been really uh, privileged to be able to drive an agenda that's focused a lot on issues affecting minority populations, particularly with the COVID pandemic and the Black Lives Matter protests that have erupted across the country. Uh, we were really one of the first organizations doing research on both topics and have really focused a lot on, uh, on so the disparate experiences that, that, that these communities have uh, have really been sort of living through in this. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a couple of data points here to just sort of underline some of what's happening now to just sort of set the stage for the rest of the group to sort of talk through. Um, so you should see our cover page here, great fun. Um, so America is very much at a crossroads right now. We are seeing that uh, there isn't actually any sort of consistency in American society about what the issue is facing America. And this is actually really characteristic of a, of a, of a very chaotic inflection moment. You know, we saw in 2009, 2010, after the Great Recession, economy and jobs are really the only thing people were focused on. But now it's a much more diffuse. People are looking at the economy. People are looking at health care and COVID. But they're also looking at racism and police brutality. So this is a very sort of formative moment where there's a lot of potential. There's a lot of things happening. Uh, and sort of figuring out what's going to come out of that is really going to be the, the, the task of groups like this to to sort of figure out how to sort of seize that moment, sort of shape the agenda moving forward to sort of emerge from the chaos with a very clear idea of what the future should hold. Um, the other thing that's sort of keep in mind is we are currently experiencing potentially the worst economic conditions in the last hundred years, but the public hasn't really caught up to that. Uh, and this is mainly because a lot of people still believe that as soon as the COVID uh, restrictions are lifted, the economy is just gonna snap back. I think the what we're seeing now across the South and the West is sort of proving that's probably not gonna be the case. We're probably gonna be dealing with COVID for a while. I've been telling a lot of people that, you know, 
focusing on the post-COVID future is maybe getting a little ahead of the game because we're going to be living with COVID for quite some time and sort of figuring out how to navigate the COVID now is, I think, equally important to the post-COVID future. Um, and speaking of COVID, we're seeing a lot of impacts of the pandemic and of the, the virus. Um, over the last three months, we saw a huge uptick in social distancing measures where people stopped socializing with friends and family. They started self-quarantining. We saw minority communities, particularly uh, the Black community, were very strong on self-quarantining or, or reduction in friends and families. The Hispanic community a little bit more sort of on average. Um, but these behaviors have become increasingly partisan, where partisanship is actually the strongest predictor of if people are sort of engaging in protective actions or if they're, they're out in the public. Um, and with the most uh, Black Americans identifying as Democrats, you sort of see most uh, Black Americans really falling into that camp of engaging in things to protect themselves in a way that the white community is not necessarily doing. Um, this is data from the CDC on cases. This is actually a couple of days old. It's actually gotten even worse over the last couple of days. But we're really what we've seen is is you know it's not a second wave. It's really it's the first wave hit the Northeast and has essentially rolled across the country over the course of three months. And we're seeing it washing up on the South and the West. And these areas people had started sort of taking for granted the coronavirus pandemic had started sort of downplaying it. I think April can sort of speak to a lot of the ethnography research that we're doing where people didn't really think it was a real thing and were sort of very cavalier about it. Now that it's happening in their communities, we're starting to see a very pronounced shift in how people are responding. Um, and this this uh, reflects the partisan uh, concern with the pandemic, the current slide. And the thing that's interesting to note is, is, like I said, there's a huge difference between Republicans and Democrats. But in the last couple of weeks, we've seen Republicans start to be more concerned with the pandemic as it has essentially started to hit red states, as Texas, as Arizona are starting to be impacted. They're starting to sort of see it in their personal lives a little bit more, and they're starting to take it a little bit more seriously. Democrats still very much... Uh, uh, much more concerned about it. And, and as a consequence, Hispanics and, and African Americans who identify as Democrats more likely than not are also much more likely to be taking it seriously than, than the white community again. Um, with that, we're seeing a change in perceived risk of COVID. Uh, people are starting at the beginning of June was sort of a period where people were the most lax about it were like, oh, we've, we're past it, everything's fine. You know, there are these protests happening across the country. COVID's history, right? We're post-COVID now. And that's shifted in the last couple of weeks. A lot of concern, increasing concern, a lot of people sort of buckling down for the second wave. So when I say there's not really a post-COVID yet, this is sort of the thing I'm talking about is people are really very much right back in it right now. Um, and again, these have hugely disparate sort of things by race and ethnicity with African Americans incredibly concerned and incredibly uh, likely to talk about the risk they're seeing, uh, as is as are Hispanic Americans. And, and that is partially because African Americans are more likely to be concentrated in some of the places that are hit, have been hit earliest, places like New York City. Um, but as it has washed across the country, you've also seen the African American community very much hit harder than most others uh, by the pandemic. In our most current data, basically half of African Americans know someone who has had COVID um, compared to only about a third of everybody. Uh, and a third of African Americans know someone who has died of COVID uh, compared to about one in eight or so of everyone. So you can sort of see just how much closer it is to that community uh, compared to, to the rest of the population. Um, in this sort of second wave or continuation of the first wave, it is very likely people are going to re-engage uh, with their sort of staying home. All right. First thing. Second thing is looking at some of the data on the protests and the demonstrations we've seen across the country. Uh, we had a team here at Ipsos who actually collected data on where the protests took place. And this is not a complete uh, map, but we found at least a thousand different locations across the country that had protests in the first couple of weeks of June, which I think really illustrates the extent to which it is a widespread movement. It's not something that's just isolated to a couple of cities. It's not just a, 
you know, New York City, Washington, D.C., L.A. phenomenon. It is very much happening everywhere in the country. You can see a lot of small towns uh, across the country had had events, and some of them had events of really considerable size. We also, as part of this exercise, we, we actually examined all of the social media we could find on each one of the protests to actually look for evidence of any sort of violence or conflict or destruction of property or altercations with police or anything else, especially, you know, there's so much focus that first week on on sort of these protests being violent, we really wanted to try to like put some sort of numbers around it to get a sense of it. And what we found is the vast majority of these protests across the country, 84% uh, as of our, our most recent data were peaceful. Um, only 16% had any sort of, of violence or property damage. And those were really concentrated in sort of that first week at the end of May and the first of June. And since then it's been 99% uh, peaceful across the country. And remember the way we sort of categorized it, that violence could have also been protester versus police violence. So it's not necessarily just protesters, you know, engaging in, in random acts, which I think sort of gives good information. This is a national movement. This is something that's happening everywhere. And it is by and large peaceful. It is not something that is contrary to some of the early reportings, violent rioting and looting. Um, it is very much sort of a, a peaceful movement for change. Um, this is data from a uh, Washington Post Ipsos poll we released last week, uh, where we did a survey of the black community in America. And we found that uh, black Americans were very sad and angry about the Floyd killing, but they were not necessarily shocked. Unfortunately, it has become all too common for black men uh, and black women to, to be killed by the police. Uh, and the thing, the place that there's real uh, difference though is the anger. Um, you know, we see all Americans much less likely to say that they're angry versus the black community. The other place is afraid. Uh, black community is also much more likely, at least twice as likely to say that they're afraid versus the, the general population. And we have more data from the survey that sort of speaks to that. One in three African Americans report feeling unsafe around a police officer in the last year. That at some occasion in the last year, they had they they feared that a police officer would physically cause them harm, um, which you know compares to one in ten among everyone. So very few whites are experiencing that, whereas one in three in the last year, uh, Black Americans have experienced that. Um, then sort of switching to sort of the purpose of the or the goals of the, the movement, there is a little bit of confusion, a little bit of diffuseness about sort of the goals. Um, there, the public is still sort of working through that. Uh, when we fielded a question with ABC News a few weeks ago early in the protests, we found only a third of Americans support defund the police. The majority are opposed to the idea. However, when we actually break that down and provide some of the some of the nuance to it, we actually find that a majority of Americans and in some cases, a large majority of Americans are supportive of the goals of the movement. They're supportive of police reform. They're supportive of accountability. They're supportive of measures to make law enforcement more racially equitable um, and supportive of efforts to uh, to reduce the amount of violence or killings of black Americans. There's just a lot of confusion about the way to do that. And when you talk about defunding the police, a lot of people hear making their lives less safe. And I think there is still a little bit of tension between sort of figuring out how do you talk about it in a way that makes people believe that their safety will be assured as well as the safety of the black community. Um, and that's important because if we actually have a forced choice where we make people pick between law and order or the protests, people are divided. White Americans and Republicans particularly are for law and order. Black Americans and Democrats are for supporting the protests. So there is still a lot of sort of tension and the society remains somewhat divided. So, so in terms of how this moves forward, it is very much gonna be about how the issue is discussed, how the issue is framed and how sort of people are made to feel uh, personally safe while also promoting safety for everyone else. Um, so that is all my data. I want to hand it back to Menica and the rest of the group. Thank you, Chris. Um, that was really helpful to set the stage. Um, so I think one of the things that we're talking about today is this longstanding divide and just um, history of inequality that has led to um, just a lot of that being even sharpened in the context of COVID um, and the movement around Black Lives Matter. 
Um, April, I thought we could start with you because as Chris mentioned, you are doing a lot of work digging into that human experience. And because we're seeing so many of these divides really come to bear right now with COVID and BLM, what are, what are some of the things you're seeing in your work um, about this divide and what's driving it? What's behind that? Yeah, so um, it's interesting because from a qualitative perspective, of course, you're not looking at the same numbers of people, right? We're talking to one person at a time, but what, what I've seen is that the stories that really illustrate the things that Chris was talking about are incredibly consistent, right? So what you'll see is um, African-Americans in particular have been very hard hit, very hard hit by this. And you can, you can feel their fear as, as they talk about it, right? Their, their, um, familiarity with people dying, their familiarity with people being sick around them, and even the the concentratedness of urban populations, right? Like it's not as easy to be socially distant when you live in a building and you've got to be in the elevator every day. So, you know, you start to hear those stories as we move forward. Um, you also start to hear the other side, which is what I think is so cool about what we do, right? I think it's very easy sometimes to only get one side of the picture. You hear people talk about how they're confused in some ways, right? You hear them talk about how, yeah, I get I, this. Seeing the, the George Floyd killing was absolutely horrendous for anyone who saw it, right? That part, everyone kind of said the same thing. And then you sort of reached a point where then it started to split, like, well, why, why was he there? And do the same things happen to white people? And why is this happening? It's sort of happening on one side of the thing. Whereas to Chris's data, you know, African-Americans weren't necessarily shocked or surprised, right? They are, they are very much, uh-huh. And now what are we gonna do about it, right? So I think, you know, I can tell individual stories that really do point to all of the things that, that Chris pointed out in the data. Yeah, I think we're seeing it, even in social conversations, there's a lot of hope that's coming through in the conversation, which I think is positive, but there is a lot of confusion, particularly when we start to dig into the conversation in our communities around like allyship and why this is happening and what people are seeing around them. I think we're seeing that people, even those that like agree with the protests, they want to take action, but they're not necessarily sure what, what to do. Yeah. yeah. What do you do? Exactly. Well, on the topic of action, Lindsay, I know um, we've been doing a lot of research together looking at the impact of brand messaging and advertising since the start of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, but we're seeing that there's definitely some resonant and relevant themes across both topics for brands. And it's been very interesting to see how brands are navigating that. What are some of the key themes that you're seeing in your research that are critical right now for brands to be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, I think I think to to your point, you know, talking about the um, even what you see in social conversations around this, you know, uh, passion for for the topics and people wanting to take action, you see brands challenged with similar things, right? Um, you know, we see a lot of brands wanting to take action, not really knowing what the right role or right place is, and um, you know, looking to make sure that they're not profiteering from um, either the pandemic, the crisis that's going on in our country, a lot of the situations and challenges that um, really consumers are looking for brands to speak up and, and play a role. And, um, you know, we do see in our data that consumers expect brands to take action and to play a role in the conversation. And one of the things that we see in terms of that I think is really important for brands to think about as you begin to um, enter into communication around you know, all of these different topics and what's going on in our country is this importance of doing and not just saying. So really thinking about advertising and action and making sure while it's you know, an incredibly generic term, the importance of authenticity is holding a lot of power right now. And consumers are looking for brands to not profiteer off, off any of the crises um, and challenges that are going on in our country, but also um, wanting them to take an action and take, take a stance in a meaningful way. And so one, you know, some of the things that we 
see that are working well versus not working well for, for different brands are you know, making sure you have that distinct voice and consumers are really open to honesty right now from brands. They do not want this to be you know, a facade of jumping on a bandwagon and just um, adding to the conversation in something that's not a meaningful way. So when we really think about that advertising in action, it's so important, you know, supported with that authentic role of the brand and making sure that you're, what you're saying, you're substantiating with your actions as a company and we've seen some brands in some challenging situations that um, maybe have put the cart before the horse without, you know, really taking a long, um, hard look at their cultural DNA and what role do they play and how do they need to change. And consumers are open to brands and companies changing. So um, that's something that I think is really important to think about. You don't have to necessarily have a longstanding, you know, history of of you know making making things right, but taking today as a point and a shift and really saying how you're going to change, what actions you're going to take, what role you're going to play as a company is something that's really important. I think the other thing that we're seeing from COVID advertising to commentary on Black Lives Matter and everything that's going on in our country is making sure that um, you have a distinct voice in it and the power of creativity is really critical and making sure that you're not getting lost in the sea of sameness of just putting generic messaging out there, really taking a look at what can I do uniquely as a brand and how can I help consumers? And that's something that we're really seeing the brands and companies that are doing well and connecting with consumers have that pure authentic voice. They're speaking the truth. They're being real with what's going on in their company, their culture, and how they can help consumers and doing it in a way that's unique and not the same as everyone else. Yeah, that's a really important point. <clears throat> I think um, there's this tendency of cancel culture happening right now. Um, well, I mean, it's been happening, but it's heightened. Um, and it's one thing, I know we've talked about this, Lindsay, in terms of uh, brands, especially in the context of systemic racism, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to say they're, they don't have some role in that, right? We all have some role. Mm -hmm. And so taking that ownership uh, definitely has to be a starting point there um, from an authentic perspective um, and then moving yeah. up to action. But I wanted to dig into the systemic racism point a bit with Chris, because I know a lot of the research that you're doing is kind of bringing light to those very clear inequalities, particularly how Black Americans have been experiencing COVID. And we even saw the Surgeon General say that systemic racism actually has led to the higher number of Black Americans um, having issues with COVID. So what are, what are some of the things you're seeing in your research linked to yeah, this? Yeah, I think, I think there's a couple of things and I, I really wanna sort of point to three. Um, you know, first and foremost, uh, when the pandemic sort of started and the economy was sort of shut down, African-Americans and Hispanic-Americans were by far more affected by that than white Americans. You know, the, the, the unemployment rate for, for the entire population jumped up to 15, 16% in April, which is probably an undercount for what the reality is, but the, the unemployment population for minority communities was at least 10 points higher. So, so you had, even before the pandemic really sort of kept, kicked into gear, a lot of people of color losing sort of their occupations, losing their career, losing their ability to sort of make ends meet. Um, and I don't think you can understate how important that is to sort of everything else that follows, because it's hard to, you know, it's hard to buy protective equipment or, you know, hand sanitizer, everything else, if you don't have a paycheck, right? Um, so that's first and foremost. Um, number two, uh, among the people who, among uh, the uh, African-American and Hispanic-American communities who didn't get laid off, they were much more likely to have occupations that required them to still go out into the world and expose themselves essentially to the risk of being infected. Uh, you know, there was, there's very much sort of a, uh, when the pandemic sort of started, there were sort of three things that happened to sort of the economy. People who were sort of affluent, who occupied knowledge economy positions essentially all went and worked from home. You know, probably most of the people on this call uh, were able to do that. And, you know, there's a reality that that is, white people are overrepresented right now in sort of that knowledge economy community, whereas people of color tend to be much more 
uh, overrepresented in sort of, uh, you know, sort of service economy jobs, which were the ones that were much more likely to be affected. So those were the ones who were either laid off or were forced to sort of go out to sort of keep making, uh, keep getting their paycheck, go out and sort of expose themselves to the pandemic. Um, so that's the second thing. And then the third thing is, I think as a consequence of that, uh, the black community was one of the ones that was hit the first and the hardest by the pandemic. And because of a history of inequality and in sort of health coverage, we're much less likely to be able to seek out sort of early intervention with the healthcare system. So ended up having much worse health outcomes due to coronavirus than, than we saw in some other places, some other countries. Uh, resulting in a community that was hit harder and had worse uh, outcomes and sort of higher mortality rates, essentially, as a consequence um, in the early the early days of the coronavirus pandemic, which I think really sort of underlines again how this has not really been a singular experience for all Americans. It's been very much a different experience for different groups. Right. Actually, April, I was hoping maybe you could dig into this a bit more because I think there's. It can be, it can get overwhelming, right? There's hope that we're we're seeing a shift, a monumental shift that's different than maybe in the past, but it also is it's a lot that we're seeing in terms of these inequalities. How how are you seeing this experience? Because I know you you really focus on empathy as a core point of how you approach ethnography in your research work. What are some of the things you're seeing in terms of how do we push through this and move forward? Um well, this, I'm not sure that this is in the research. I mean, what you'd see in the research is people struggling, as, as I mentioned before, right? You see people who um, are dealing with different parts of this pandemic in different ways, right? So it is, it is a huge elephant, right? And everybody's kind of got their hand on a different part of that elephant and seeing different things happening. So what you'll see in the research is people kind of speaking from their perspective. And I think what's happened today is, you know, you know, we've talked a lot about how our bubbles have become smaller and smaller. Those perspectives become harder and harder to be broad. The perspectives get very narrow and we're all, we're all guilty of that. Um, so I think from, from a research perspective, it's interesting kind of seeing the different stories because I can hear one that feels so foreign to, to me personally, but it is reality, right? So um, it's just as valid to hear everyone's side of that, of that story. Um, from a, and again, this is not from a research perspective, this is April Jeffrey's opinion, having, having lived through this um, in my own way in a, in a hot spot, if you will. Um, I think the, the only way to really get through this is for us to be able to tell those stories in a way that we can have some empathy for someone who's got their hand on another piece of this elephant, right? So how do you, you know, we talk in terms of empathy about put, you know, stepping in someone else's shoes and how can you feel that? There are some things in this systemic racism that we're talking about that you can only know if you have experienced it that when you talk to someone who has not been in that position, literally eyes glaze over like, I have no idea either what you're talking about or I have no idea that what I said or did could be viewed that way, right? And so that's the side where you said earlier, Manika, uh, you know, people are wondering, how can I help? I don't even really completely get it. What are some of the resources that you can give me to help with that? So the only way in my, in my opinion to get through it is to start to, to talk more, to have better conversations and to have conversations with the intent of empathy, of real empathy, where you can start to feel what someone else may have felt through this and not argue about it and not discount it, but to feel it first, then go into the conversation around now, how can I bring my resources, my way of thinking about things? How can I bring that to help solve this problem? Because, you know, to, to deny it is not the answer that, you know, it's sort of like, how do you, how do you start to understand it better so that you can then, you know, maybe bring a different way of handling it. So mm -hmm. I hope that yeah, to, under, to underline April's point, like we, we do have data 
showing that really since the start of the pandemic, anxiety levels for everyone has just gone through the roof and everyone is sort of a raw nerve right now. Um, so her point about being empathetic, like I just 100% agree that like, you know, we need to figure out how to be kind to each other um, in order to open those doors and open those conversations because everyone's just struggling right now. And Manika, you said something earlier that I think is interesting. Um, you were talking about, uh, you know, or maybe it was you, Lindsay, who said this, you can't, you can't go back and undo whatever you've done, right? Let's make this be a starting point, because I think there's a lot of guilt and a lot of, you know, what could I, should I, would I have done? Um, and Absolutely. I think this is a good time to just, you know, okay, let's clear that out, move forward, mm -hmm. learn from it, and, and keep going as, as a new starting point. Yeah, I think, you know, like we see that, we see that a lot, just in terms of, you know, there's this fear about where I've been, what I've done, particularly for brands and, and companies and individuals of, you know, that that fear of the history versus, okay, acknowledge and let's, you know, have an honest conversation and, and move forward. And I think that's where that role of empathy, whether it's for individuals or brands really needs to play, you know, a quintessential part of the core of how we move forward as um, a country from a corporate standpoint, from, you know, citizens, from individuals. And that's where, where I think we'll see real change happen. Yeah, so I actually wanted to build on that because I think we're seeing in a lot of our research, um, you know, we've, we've been asking consumers what, what brands are standing out in the midst of COVID, what brands are standing out in the midst of BLM. The, the underlying thread in all of that research is humanity. Like, I want to know that you care about me as a human. Um, and I think to your point, April, that what that means, what humanity means can be very different for different people. So it's like having that empathy piece um, is really, really critical, I think, to everyone kind of finding a place to move forward and change. One thing um, that, Lindsay, I wanted to talk to you about that, that's obviously been incredibly unprecedented in the last week um, is a lot of big major brands taking some big action with the stop hate for profit campaign. Um, what are what are some of the things that your team's looking at in that context? Obviously this has huge implications on advertising and, and what that looks like moving mm -hmm. forward. Yeah, I mean I think, you know, like one of the things that, you know, going back to kind of even the conversation we were just having is really trying to understand what do, you know, brands can take, you know, a lot of big unprecedented action. What does it mean and what's meaningful as part of that to consumers and to our culture? And so that's one of the things that we're really trying to dig into and understand as an, as an organization um, to help a lot of our clients understand what, what is it that people want and see as meaningful and helpful. And so, you know, one of the things thinking, you know, specifically on the BLM topic and brands role and that, um, you know, what consumers are really expecting from brands is to be this conduit to help with social progress. And um, yes, there's this desire for a feeling of optimism, but there's something more substantial that consumers want from, from brands and companies. When we think about this, there's really kind of two, two kind of key uh, actions that consumers expect from brands. And it's about helping to progress forward social, social progress, and then also that opportunity to act as a conduit to help consumers feel empowered to take action themselves. So earlier to what you were talking about with what we're seeing a lot in the social conversation of, you know, a lot of people wanna take action. They don't know how, they don't know what to do. A lot of people feel paralyzed of, I don't know what my personal role is in this or how to be empathetic to the situation or do something meaningful. And we're seeing a very large portion of consumers wanting brands to help be that enabler for that. So, you know, I think one of the things that is, is interesting when we think about this, you know, it's that, that fine line of not, you know, profiteering from a, you know, PR push versus actually taking action. And what we're seeing from a COVID standpoint and from a BLM standpoint is consumers want brands to take meaningful action that they also can have a role in. And, you know, you see whether it's from, you know, our pub public affairs polling, from social conversation, from some of the data that we've collected specifically around brands and advertising is that action and authenticity are the foundation of everything. And so it's really being authentic and empathetic with the right voice 
and figuring out what that action is. And it can be small things, whether it's from, um, you know, supporting education, taking very small, clear steps to change your organization and or um, making a connection with your consumers or customers in a way to help them do something meaningful. And those are the things where, you know, we've seen a, a lot of conversation and change in the advertising world specifically, but those are the things that matter the most and that consumers see are really going to change the way they feel and interact with brands. And we do see that um, the brands that do this the best, um, consumers are, are saying they're going to be more loyal, they're going to really engage with these brands brands more, but it, it has to be done in a pure and true way. Hey, Lindsay, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. is, is there, have you ever seen um, any kind of risk or backlash to that? I mean, to the extent that you support one thing, given what Chris showed, you can yeah. definitely not be supporting something else, right? So have you seen backlash from it? Yeah, you know, like there's there's definitely been been a lot of backlash, particularly I think, you know, when there's that, that view that there's profiteering from it, um, as well as, you know, there there is a divide. I think, you know, we see that about 60% of people want brands talking about social um, justice issues. And there's 40, you know, almost 40% that don't. And so there's, there's a pretty clear divide. There's not a lot of people that are very neutral. And so I think, you know, a big part of it is understanding, um, you know, what that divide is and what it really means for the brand and what kind of company, you know, a, a brand wants to be and, and what's important for that. So when you, when you think about, you know, some of the backlash that, um, some of the different brands brands have received it it kind of goes on the spectrum of whether it's like political agreement with a stance that's being taken or you know calling calling a company out that they're not really um, practicing what they preach so a, bi a big thing that we've talked a lot about with our clients is is that essential part of you know preaching what you practice so making sure that you have the practices in place as an organization and that whatever you're speaking about re regardless of side that it's part of your your cultural DNA. A big part that we also see in terms of kind of the divide in um, consumers' opinions around brands speaking on these different topics is, you know, there's definitely a location from a geographic standpoint difference. We see this is a very, you know, heavy um, younger consumer millennial push of expectation of brands speaking up. And when you think about the longevity of the life of a consumer, it's important to make sure you're connecting with your young consumers. They really care about this. And it's something that I think is, is important. We also see that it's a much more, uh, you know, a metropolitan push when you look at consumers, particularly April, as you've seen, when you speak to consumers from different experiences, there's, you know, a lot more passion for, you know, COVID, for, um, BLM coming from major metropolitan areas, probably due to um, personal experience. And so I think, you know, a big part of what we see is, is there's this opportunity for continued education from brands to help with some of that backlash and really making sure that whatever they're speaking on, that consumers understand where they're coming from and why they're, why they're taking a stance or speaking on a specific topic, because there is a disparity in terms of not only desire for agreement or speaking on a topic, but also understanding of it as well. And yeah. if I may provide just a little bit of a different lens, one of the reasons I think we're seeing so many people looking to companies and brands to be leaders in this issue is because they've lost faith in the government to do it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Americans trust in the government, the federal government is at something close to an all time low. Uh, through the pandemic, it's been dropping. And yet at the same time, trust in uh, and employers and brands and public health officials have stayed stable and relatively high. So really people are sort of looking to the private sector to lead here because they don't know who else can do it, right? So it's sort of a, mm -hmm. it's a mantle that has been put on the, the private sector that maybe they didn't want, but now they've got it and have to figure out how to, how to use it well. Yeah, I think and that I brings me to a lot with brand trust, like brand trust remaining pretty stable throughout this from a standpoint. Sorry, that brings me to my last question because we have about five minutes. But Chris, um, you know, obviously action, a lot of the action that we're seeing people talking about right now is voting. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's primaries today in a few states. The, a lot of people in social, we're seeing a ton of people talking about November. That's coming through in a lot of our community conversations as well, um, especially to your earlier point that the post-COVID world feels like when is that even possible? Um, yeah, more than it did. You know, I remember when it was just like, let's bake bread and we'll get through this. And however, right. yeah, how long is this going to last? So knowing that and knowing that the, the election coming up in November is a big piece of, of how action could play a big role in our future. What are some of the things you're seeing as I know you are obviously polling a lot in the upcoming elections? What are some of the issues that are on Americans' minds right now? Is um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so of course it's it's the pandemic, it's COVID um, and the economy uh, as a consequence of the COVID pandemic. But one of the things we've been seeing over the last couple of weeks emerging as an issue that is new and kind of different and something that makes me at least a little bit hopeful is there's actually a lot of focus of Americans right now on the idea of reestablishing trust or reestablishing functional government. Um, that it was something that was just sort of a, an also ran type topic four, five, six months ago. Like nobody really cared about it so much. But in the last couple of weeks, uh, that has become the number one issue when we give people a list of things that like what's the main thing affecting their vote. The idea of having sort of trusted, established, reliable government is now become sort of the plurality thing. So it's interesting because it really has sort of, there's been the pandemic, the economy, the protest, all of them together have really sort of crystallized for a lot of people how, you know what, we can't necessarily just have a, you know, a government that is about sort of cleaning out the swamp, whatever that means. We do need a functional government that can actually deliver in times of crisis. And that's what sort of people are looking to right now. Um, you know, and, and among people who have that as their priority set, they support Biden sort of two to one. Got it. You can't give us any predictions though, right? Because yeah. I mean, I can, but you know, all predictions wrong or your money back. Um, <laughs> no, right. If the election were held today, uh, Biden would probably win. Uh, that being said, you know, it's four months until election day and this has been the craziest year in the last century. So I'm pretty positive something else insane is gonna happen that may scramble everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's an understatement about 2020, right? Mm -hmm. I heard someone say 2020 is hind hindsight is 2020 was probably someone from the future. Yeah. 2020. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think we just have a couple minutes. I thought just to, to conclude, um, maybe each of you can just give a very quick uh, thought on um, how the work that we're doing is helping our clients take action. Because action seems to be the biggest thing that is going to push us forward, that's going to create meaningful change. Um, how can brands be using data and insights better? And, and what does that look like from your perspective? April, you want to start? Yeah, so I think, I think the best thing you can do right now is tell the human story. Tell the story because it's the only way people can really step into someone else's, you know, what it is they're going through. And then you can justify any backlash, right? You can justify it based on the human story that you have decided to tell and to back with real action. That's great. Lindsay? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, again, it's it's just really understanding what not only the human story is, but, you know, your consumer's perceptions and, and really understanding the nuance even of language right now. I think that's something that's really important that we're helping um, a lot of our clients with to, to understand the way they tell a story and the language they use to make sure that it's really um, connected and empathetic to support that human story that we uh, really look to understand. Any parting words from you, Chris? Uh, no, I just think that, you know, understanding the human story, like April said, is, is really important. And, you know, we're really privileged to be able to be researchers because our job is essentially helping people tell their stories, helping give them a voice, helping that voice be heard. So, you know, I think just trying to make sure that we're hearing those stories and sharing them is, is you know, that's the, that's the best thing that we can be doing right now. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I think that's it. And uh, we'll pass it back to Anna. Bye.